Hi everyone, I am Zeke. I hope you guys have had a lovely morning. I know there's a lot of things going on outside, but glad to see all of you guys here safely. Um, I will be speaking a little bit more about the ABCs of design and tech ethics. So this is, again, um, not my first time here. I actually, I was here five years ago. So that was me back then with a little bit of hair, and then now lesser hair. Yeah? Um, 2018, I was here really sharing a little bit more about the repercussions of design interventions in developing world. Now, in 2018, when I was here, I was really talking about, hey, we need to be careful about our design, right? There are potential negative repercussions if you are not conscious and not thinking about the repercussions of, of the impact of our design, right? So that was what I was preaching five years ago. Now, five years later, in between, I've also been in the UK. I've been studying there for a bit. I've also worked there for quite a bit. Um, and today, I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about the ABCs of design ethics. It is essentially a tool, right? So a framework that I'll share in a bit about how we can hopefully be, be, be a bit more responsible in, in our design, in our design process. So for me to talk about the, the ABCs of design and tech ethics, I need to bring you guys back to the courtroom. So this is all the way back to 2019, where back then it was the tech clash. So in 2019 tech clash, we, we saw how Google, you know, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, all of them ended up in a courtroom, right? Under intense scrutiny of like lawmakers, right? There was a lot of concerns around data and privacy. There was a lot of concerns about the things that they were doing going unchecked. Now, with the emergence of Gen AI this year, uh, there's also a lot of concerns, right? So open AI, concern about compromising elections, Google with the BART, Samsung with chat GPT data leak. So we're seeing all of these things, right? But we're also seeing some actions, right? So like in the EU recently, they just released uh, uh, AI Act, right? And that's to sort of like regulate and help us to be a bit more considered in how we're using these emerging technologies, right? So hopefully history won't repeat itself, but there are things that we need to consider when we are thinking about new and emerging technologies. Kenneth Bowles, who's author of the, uh, a book called Future Ethics, he talks about an eight an ethical awakening is long overdue. Um, it was also echoed by sociologist Richard Sennett, who talks about, it's at the level of mastery, that ethical problems of craft appear. Now, what does that mean? Is It's actually an indicator that the industry is maturing. So if you look at any kind of industry, when we start talking about ethical implications, it is a sign that you know, we want to be more responsible about how we operate. Right? So, and we're seeing that in the design industry, right? We're seeing that even in emerging technologies such as AI, right? We're starting to ask ourselves, what is the ethical implications around these new technologies? And it's a good sign, right? It means we are going a level up. But what the heck is ethics? <laughs> Here we are all designers. I'm also a designer, so I don't proclaim, I don't claim myself as an ethicist. But from my research, I'm going to try to help break this down a bit so that we all kind of a a little bit of a common understanding of what it is, yeah? So bear with me, Ethics 101. So usually when we talk about the modern ethics, there's summarized in three pillars. So the first one is virtue ethics. It's all about values, value systems. Geontology or duty ethics talks about responsibility, our duty as designers. And utilitarianism is about consequentialism, a little bit more about consequences, yeah? So the few things that you can think about or ask yourself when thinking about the pillars, for instance, virtue ethics, you can ask yourself, would I be happy for this to be a front page story when we are designing something? Duty ethics, we can think about what if everyone did what I'm about to do? Am I treating people as ends or means? And when we're thinking about utilitarianism or consequentialism, am I maximizing happiness for the greatest number? To summarize all of that, Hopefully this makes a bit more sense, which is ethics are shared societal rules, principles that helps us distinguish what is right or wrong in the way we live our lives. I emphasize on the shared societal rules and principles. What this means is it's highly contextual, right? So what maybe is accepted here in Bangalore may not be accepted somewhere in the north, or what is accepted in India as a societal sort of like shared principles may be not accepted in another country where I'm from, Singapore, right? So everyone, every community, they have this shared principle, right? And it differs, and it's highly contextual. That's why when you talk about ethics, it's not so black and white, yeah? It's really about how the group sees it. 
So, that was a quick spiel on ethics. But what does this mean for us as designers, right? What does this mean? So, my journey so far has been trying to like bridge the practical world of design with the very philosophical world of ethics. And that has been sort of like my mission. <laughs> Try to make it a bit easier about what is this ethics thing and then how do I bridge it to our work as designers. In my research, I came across things like uh, the Ethical Design Manifesto by Errol Balkan and Laura Kalbeck. And they talked about ethical design respecting human experience. Ethical design respects human effort. Ethical design also respects human rights. In my research as well, there's a bunch of other things that are sort of like talking about responsibility or a shared value system, like the First Things First Manifesto or for graphic designers back, there, back in the day. There's a lot of other... Oh, the book, Future Ethics by Kenneth Bowles, that's also something that I highly recommend if you are very interested in about ethics and uh, design and innovation. Yeah? But there's a lot of things that I looked up there, and I've also tested this with so many uh, teams globally, right? Uh, the, the toolkit that I'm going to share is something that I've uh, shared around, tested it with many design teams across the globe, running many workshops to sort of like understand, right? What, where does ethics sit in within this design process? Or is it even a thing? Or is it just a fluffy term um, that no one really actually act upon? So in my research strategy as well, when I'm trying to think about how do I bring ethics into design, I realized that it needs to happen at three levels. Now, for any interventions in any industry to happen and to be adopted sustainably, it needs to happen at three levels. So from the individual level, which is like us designers from a group level as the tech and design industry, and it needs to also happen or intervention at the systems level where this is where your policy comes in on a national level. Yeah? So if all three have an understanding of that, then ethics may be adopted a bit more sustainably. And this is all borrowed from uh, organizational design, so OD, right? So I wrote it there. Now, from all of that research that I just flicked through, these are the five key insights that I want to share with you guys today. This is what I've learned, yeah? So the first insight is that design ethics manifest in different forms and words. And there was a need to simplify the language. I bet a lot of us don't re remember the half of the things that I said around virtue ethics and consequentialism and all these things. So, there was this need to simplify it. It also emerged in other conversations in terms of like, oh, people think about sustainability or people think about how do I make my website more accessible, right? Accessibility guidelines, right? So those are the other words, uh, terminology that comes up in replacement of sort of like ethics. Now, the second insight is that there's a conflict between designing for business versus designing for what is right and ethical. So sometimes now designers are in this ethical dilemma of, yeah, I want to you know, design something that get people to maybe uh, not be so addicted to a platform, right? But then from a business perspective, oh, I want them to be on the platform as long as they can because then I can you know, give them more ads or I can make more, more money out of them, blah, blah, blah. So the success metrics are always a little bit in conflict between uh, you know, what is, I guess, seemingly right or what people want to do is what they think is right versus what the business needs. So there's sort of like this misalignment or tension, yeah? Uh, the third thing is that there's a high barrier of entry uh, and high resistance to adopt. So when every time I talk to ethics or about ethics to design teams or design organizations, they'll be like, what is this, right? Uh, this belongs in the realm of philosophy or this belongs to another team in my department, not the design team. So it's not seemingly the, the responsibility of the designers or the design team. So they are quite resistant to hearing about stuff like that. The other thing, uh, the fourth one, is really about making it more measurable. So ethics, uh, a lot of times when I speak to like head of departments or head of design uh, teams, they, they'll be like, cool, everybody want to do good. That's true, but we also have KPIs. So going back to that second insight about the conflict of uh, sort of like tension between what the business wants versus what is right, um, one way of it was try, let's make it measurable. Can we turn this into a KPI? Can we show that by being ethical, there is obviously business um, uh, sort of, uh, what do you call it? It, it Im impacts our business in a positive way, yeah? So, Making it measurable could help make a business case to why we need to be ethical or adopt ethical practices. And then lastly is leverage on the design process. Zig, 
don't give me another sort of like entire new framework, right? We've already been, you know, bombarded with so many different kind of frameworks. We don't need a new one. So the feedback or the insight that I've learned from a lot of the design teams, can we just leverage on what we already have? Yeah? And not try to reinvent the wheel so much. So to summarize, it's all these five things that I've learned. Let's look at language. Can we simplify it? Can we try to reduce that tension and conflict? Lower the barrier of entry to it? ethics and design, can we make this, can we measure this, and then can we please leverage on the design process? To make this a bit more focused, I turn it into a how might we statement, right? So how might we lower the barrier of entry for designers by simplifying the language, leverage on the existing design process, measure those outcomes, so that we can help empower all these uh, design teams to navigate. So from this how might we statement, came three projects which I'm going to share a little bit more today, yeah? So the first one um, is going to be tackling about language, the second one is a toolkit, and then the last one is a platform. So I'll just walk you guys through. So I bring this back up again. Yeah, the three pillars, probably a lot of us uh, don't remember what I said, which, which is fine because I also don't remember when I first did this, yeah? So this was quite complicated apparently to a lot of people, yeah? So what I've done is then turn it into ABC, yeah? So the ABC methodology starts off with alignment. So alignment is actually talking about virtue ethics. So it is looking at does this design that I'm about to produce, does it align with the value of my team? Does it align with the people that I'm designing for? Right? What is the value system of the people that I'm designing for? And it's very important, right? Because like I said, ethics is highly contextual. Something that I may design for this group of people may not be accepted to another group of people. So it is imperative that we understand research comes into play, right? Understanding our users, and you guys are all designers. So that's something that is very important, so alignment. The second thing is best practice. So best practice is uh, it's about deontology, duty ethics. So what is my responsibility as a designer? Now, it's also looking at best in class example. So also for us to look at what are the standards and guidelines that are set in the industry, right? So from the web, uh, Web3C guidelines or accessibility guidelines, universal guidelines. So there are things that as designers, it is also imperative for us to go and know all of those things. Lastly is consequences. That is pretty straightforward, right? So in a way, we need to think and ask ourselves what are the neg potential negative consequences of our design. Now as designers, obviously, I think, on the baseline, we all trying to make things better, right? So we don't intentionally, I hope, <laughs> design something that is going to be have a negative impact. But I think it is a good practice, or it's a practice that we need to do more of, which is to think about what is the potential negative impact of our design. Right? We don't usually put that hat on, and I think we should start practicing more. Essentially, that is the ABC. So if you look at the double diamond, so alignment start off at the first diamond, right? So alignment is all about understanding the value system. So that happens in your research phase, right? You understand the community, you understand the value system, what are their needs, right? When we go into ideation, we should start looking at best practice, right? What are the best in class examples? What are the things that I can borrow? What are the things I could follow? And what are the things that I should not do, maybe, right? So that's also where we start to look at ideas. And then the last line of defense at the tail end of the diamond is consequences. So before you roll out your design or you make it go public or you launch it, there's a need for us to think about what are the potential harm that this design could do. Yeah? So even though ABC sits like that in terms of where it could emerge, ABC should actually happen throughout the process. So alignment, best practice, consequences should always be something that you are considering thinking about throughout your whole design process. So this is an example of how ABC now is leveraging on the design process. Which then brings me to the second project, which is the toolkit. So a lot of people will be like, oh yeah, so you, you simplify the language, but how do I act on this, right? What does this look like? So I've also worked with um, a lot of design teams, and one of them I had the pleasure to work with the Ministry of Justice, uh, Digital Justice in the UK. Um, and basically we were using the toolkit to look at how we can design a product for a person who's applying for legal aid uh, to protect themselves from the abuser. So we were using this toolkit as a means to start off like I did and looking at the, the value system, what are the values that we've learned from the users, and then going to the best practice, what are the standards and the guidelines that we should adhere to when we're dealing with people who are maybe in an abusive relationship, we need to consider. And then lastly, the consequences matrix there, where we map out as many negative 
uh, potential uh, sort of like harm to the design, and then we mitigate them. So, sorry, it's a little bit small, um, but yeah, the table here at the end is a list of negative outcomes, and then the second uh, column there is about who will own this, right? So every time we talk about ethics, people are like, oh yeah, you know, it's good, it's bad, blah blah blah, but no one really act on it. So the last PDF or last page there is listing down all the negative outcomes and then who's going to own this? Is it a conversation that I need to have with another project team or is this something that I need to speak to a minister or is this something that I need to work with another organization? And then what's happening after that, right? So this becomes almost like a, imagine if you have designed something and you have a long list of negative uh, sort of like con uh, impact, you can bring up to your uh, boss or you can bring it up to your team lead, right? Like, hey, these are the potential harm that I've done. I've assessed my design. This is the potential harm. What are we going to do about it? Because I don't feel comfortable with maybe launching this product or how can we mitigate this? How can we, can we reduce the negative outcomes of our designs? So then it makes us more accountable, yeah? So I've done this with many teams around the world. And as I mentioned, I worked with the Ministry of Justice. And I think what was very interesting was uh, the feedback that I got from uh, Nicola Gogge, who's the head of design at Ministry of Justice. And she talks about the toolkit is, is great, but it's very limited to the people in the room, right? So when we were talking about negative consequences, it's really the five people in the room thinking about very hard, or oh, what is the potential harm this product or this design can do, right? If I bring in a policy person in the room, then the policy person will have a very different look at how this design can have negative harm. So she's essentially saying it, it depends on the people in the room, right? And that to me was quite interesting because then this is the limitations of the toolkit, the physical toolkit that I've designed, right? It's limited to the five people who are using this to as assess the tool. So which then sort of like segue into the, the third project, which is this design etiquette platform. And I think I have a short video to maybe play to show a little bit more about how it works. Give it a second, hopefully. In 2019, tech giants found their way into the courtroom, a tech clash indicating that the industry is faced with an ethics crisis. But it's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. So how do we consider ethics in our designs and be more responsible for the outcomes? Presenting Design Etiquette, a community-driven evaluation tool that uses collective intelligence to provide insights to designers on how their designs are received in different contexts, places and societies. Designers can upload a logo design, queries on a color, a design feature to full end-to-end -end product and services for evaluation. Designs are evaluated using ABC metric, which is based on the three pillars of modern ethics. Alignment is based on virtue ethics. Through collective intelligence, the alignment tool looks at how designs matches up with a society's values. Best practice is based on beauty ethics, where designs are evaluated by experts against industry standards and guidelines. While consequences is based on consequentialism, surfacing as many unintended consequences as possible through collective intelligence, prompting an action plan to account, address and mitigate. Through the ABC metric, designs are then fed back to designers with an indicator of how it was received, providing an opportunity for continuous improvements and mitigating negative impacts. Design etiquette, a community-driven evaluation tool for facilitating ethical outcomes. Cool. So there was just a quick preview of the platform. And essentially, it is, think of, a, of it as a platform where it's like a portfolio website, right? You upload your design and then you get feedback. Um, but in this case, we're using the ABC metrics, right, to, to sort of like evaluate your design and then give you an indicator. So how that could look like is, say, imagine like you are the team at Facebook and you're about to launch a new feature within Facebook. In this case, maybe you're trying to launch Facebook reactions, right? And you upload, the, your, the design team will upload this on our platform and then they will evaluate it. Um, and it based on uh, what you call collective intelligence, the community sort of like driven evaluation using the ABC, they will get an indicator. So in this case, they get a say overall indicator of red, um, but they can also see maybe on a global scale, like how is it be being received in different countries. So 
this is just an example of like other maybe different design features or from other people design teams that are uploading their work and then getting evaluated by the metrics. Yeah. So, but here also then is sort of like again very dependent on human intelligence, which actually today's I want to like present a little bit more about a new one that we are trying to share or we're trying to produce, we're trying to make, <laughs> which is uh, Descent.co. So this, I will invite my CTO, uh, Sita, to share a little bit more about uh, this new project. Yeah, good morning everyone. So as Zeke mentioned earlier, we wanted to move from evaluating people's designs using collective intelligence to automating the process, right? So we started by looking at common metrics that are used currently, things like the sustainability index, the accessibility, the Google accessibility index, etc. And from there we moved to using machine generative uh, intelligence to try and evaluate people's designs. So we, start, so we start by asking you more about your user, right? Do you have a user persona? Can you give us more information about who you're developing for? And then give us more context based on research you've done on where you're developing this for. And then provide contextual indicators, right? So after that, we ask you for your how might we statement. We ask you to upload or give us a link to your design. And then we tie it all back to the ABC metric, right? Does it align with the user you've told us about? Does it align with the best practices in the industry that you've already told us you're designing for? And then what are the consequences of your design, right? And then we give you a report card to basically help you assess how your design lands in different countries. And the benefit of using uh, Gen AI is we can scale this up a lot more and a lot faster. We don't have to rely on people in the room. We can basically access a greater pool of intelligence. So, closing remarks. Uh, short video, very short video. So this is just uh, some testimonial from people who have used uh, the ABC metrics. Hopefully it loads again. It's okay, we're good on time. <laughs> so. so models like the ABC model are useful because they provide policy makers with systematic tools to be able to think, th think things through. Because ethics is quite a meaty complex topic and it's almost untangible. I think ABC, it makes ethics tangible. It means anyone can pick it up and work with it and start thinking about how they apply it to their products, their project, anything they do. Diversity, which is something that has been important to myself and Fullproof, is even more important now. And Zeke, this work is, is, is really key to remind ourselves if we don't have diverse voices around that table, we will not ensure we're covering all those consequences. I think it was a, an, an excellent also conversation starter because ethics is, is a topic that's getting more and more important. So one of our product managers said, it's, yeah, it's, it's the new big data. Um, so it's, it's one of the things that we're definitely going to focus on in the next year. So yeah, do that. Yeah, so just last note is that I think as designers, right, as we are constantly designing in a highly complex world, I think it's imperative that we have access to multiple lenses to see the world in, be it ethics, be it engineering, be it science, be it any other field. I think it is important for us to have those lenses as we navigate and design more responsibly um, in an ever-changing and highly complex world. So with that, thank you everyone thank for, you. for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. I believe not, but I have a question, yeah. So, I actually wanted to know your point of view on ethics and social media right now. I saw that we had a clip from Mark Zuckerberg about uh, how ethics was not taken into consideration, but do you think it is ethical right now, the way Facebook, Instagram work? Wow. Um, whether it's ethical right now, I think, like, again, it depends on sort of like the societal value and how they see it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the research, but obviously there has been a few articles around like, you know, being, people being addicted to it. And there's a lot of things that even like uh, phones are trying to do, like, like Apple, I guess, iPhone, they're trying to maybe help reduce screen time right? and giving feedback to the users that, hey, you've been spending a lot of hours on Instagram, for example, right? And try to reduce that. So I think there is some steps taken 
to try to make it a, like less negative impact. Mm -hmm. um, but at the stage, at this stage, I think it is a work in progress. Um, Sita, do you have anything to say? And it depends a lot, again, on the context, right? Like some countries are really, really dependent on Facebook. Their whole mm -hmm. lives are on Facebook, their marketplace, their WhatsApp. Whereas some other countries are not, right? Like they're on iMessage. And so it's evaluated differently. And so we, we should keep that in mind.